So I think about half of you know me. I'm uh, David Henkel Wallace. Uh, I'm uh, one of the partners at uh, Leela. And uh, today, uh, since hardly anybody has heard of Leela, so we've been sort of working away, writing code, and being uh, accidentally stealthy. I'm going to start with a 50,000 foot overview of what Leela is. I'm going to talk about why we built Leela. Um, based on what it is, and start to justify that, and then start you to tell about some of the architectural decisions we made and actually then actually show you running code, because that's always better than an actual talk. Uh, and then I'm going to do a breadth first path through this, because I don't know how much anybody knows, especially in the uh, student audience out in the camera land, about what AI used to be and what AI is today, and, uh, and why, why, I, why, why I care. Uh, and so I can do arbitrary amounts of depth first uh, question answering uh, when we're done for that. So a quick uh, who, where, and when. Uh, we're a small team. We're not affiliated with any big organization. We're just working on our own. We're not part of Stanford or MIT or you know, Google or any big company. Um, we're just uh, funding it ourselves. Uh, we're a bunch of old farts, uh, primarily from the AI lab in the uh, Seymour Papert, Marvin Minsky era. Uh, both of those guys have been very influential on, 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 on what we're working on. Um, we haven't been publishing any papers. We've just been writing, run, preferring to write uh, running code. Um, and we're, we're self-funded, although if anybody wants to pull out their checkbook, uh, we're willing to change that mode. But that's not the purpose of the call, talk today. So in a nutshell, what is Leela? Okay, well, Leela is, I got two slides. The first thing is, how does Leela think of the world, right? It's a fundamental representation based on functional semantics. Okay, that means if I, if I take some action, what do I believe will happen, happen as a result of that action? Okay, and it builds out of those. You can think of them as, I'll come to that later, as like little capsule networks, but active capsule networks, if you're familiar with that. Uh, what it isn't is a traditional neural network or perceptron system. There's no cat perceptron um, and uh, meatloaf t perceptron that you use to, dis to disambiguate between what's that, what's that thing in the picture. Because in fact, what constitutes a cat is really an emergence, emergent phenomenon. And to, to say, is that a cat or is that not a cat, really depends on the context with which you're asking the question, uh, what, why you want to ask that question. You know, is that is something I want to eat or something I want to touch? Meatloaf might be hot or unsanitary. Um, and you know, how to allow you to, to search quickly. You know, you, because you'll use a whole different set of discriminatory activities when you're outdoors. You're probably not even consider you're going to find a meatloaf when you're walking in your garden, but a cat is, is quite likely to be there. So that's when we mean semantics. We mean a system that actually takes the meaning and context into account. Um, not just when taking action or, or, or planning, but even at the level of individual state items. Okay. Another core difference from, uh, from uh, what's considered AI today is uh, all of the core data structures are inherently composable. So your state vectors, of course, can be primitive states, like there's a little patch of blue right there, or my hand happens to be at this location. But they can also encompass uh, synthetic results or acquire computation to actually perform. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later. Um, but that's for thing. That's how you build up systems to, so the system can develop an understanding of hidden state, uh, object persistence, and things like that. But still use these synthetic items just like they would use any, any primitive item. Likewise, plans are completely composable. Goals, when you want to achieve goal, you can break them down, and you can also inspect them, which gives you other kinds of capabilities. Um, Composable might mean that um, I might have a, an item that has um, a, uh, represents a bottle that is um, that's got some liquid on it on the table, and I know a lot of other properties about this bottle that I'm, I've that the system has learned on its own, such as you know you don't want to tip it over because things come out, or it tends to be heavy, doesn't tend to move on its own, and that all that cluster of state factors can be used elsewhere. Likewise, um, when planning, you can just decompose a plan into some simpler plans, which you'll see there, and um, and build therefore more complex plans out of them. Uh, so this is composable in the comp in the standard computer science sense of composable. I guess what I should say. Um, architecturally, uh, the work is based on the constructivist model of Jean Piaget. I don't know if uh, how many people are familiar with him. He was, by the way, Seymour's PhD advisor. 
So there's an interesting piece of, uh, of uh, continuity there, um, which has been very influential uh, on the design of this on, on, on all of us. Um, our design, uh, you might have seen, I'll talk about it in a moment, that, that Leela is an agent. I said that in the summary. And, and Leela's design is based on what humans do because it's very important to build systems that behave, exhibit common sense that people are comfortable working with. And those things are grounded in, in how humans behave. Doesn't mean that we're, you know, like the Numenta guys, we're trying to actually emulate the new, you know, uh, neuronal structure of human beings. But you're guided by what kind of failure modes people have, how child, children develop, and Leela develops following Piaget's uh, analysis of how human development human childhood development works. So I have a little slide on that in a moment. Um, and like a human baby, it boots up knowing nothing really about the world. It's only uh, state inputs are primitive inputs. That is uh, proprioceptive inputs, for example, uh, visual inputs from, from the eye. And over time, Leela starts to learn that, oh, if I move my hand, I see something move in my visual field. Let me do an experiment and see, oh, OK. That is actually something I can control. And the idea that it's actually a hand, that later it can use as an effector and do things, evolve uh, through experimentation and, and, and development um, in the world. So Leela, Leela doesn't start with any uh, pre-primed uh, knowledge about the world. So Leela has computer vision, and it has speech recognition. And has very, very simple computer vision, the schematic computer vision. Right now, Leela only runs in simulation. Uh, we were saying that outside in the, in the corridor. There's a little bit of disagreement on our team whether we should, you know, if you're in simulation, you can really look at your algorithms on the other end. When you do I.O., you learn a lot of stuff about what you're doing. So we're, doing, we're just starting to do a little bit of I.O. right now. So is object permanence something that it learns? It yes. It, Leela has demonstrated object, learning object uh, permanence. That's one of our most recent um, accomplishments, which is sort of gotten to the edge of that. But yes, Leela learned that on her own. Okay. Now, it's an agent. That's the sort of software. Okay, well, what are you doing with this software? Okay, Leela is an agent modeling the, um, but following, developing like a child. Leela's not a, just a, a program or an algorithm or a single, single thing. Yeah. It may be off track, so excuse me, but is there a reason why you give it a female gender? <laughs> Uh, there is, um, but um, there's no insight in why it is. I happen, A, because people always say he, and that bugs me that people always say he in English. Um, and actually, Leela, coincidentally, one of, one of my colleagues thought up the name. We all liked it. But it happens to be my aunt's name. So automatically, when I think of Leela, I, I like the she. So there's no insight to be read from it. Um, so Leela is. As a general purpose agent, Leela is not designed to solve a specific problem. So there's some pretty amazing results that have come out. Uh, I mean, we see them every day. Um, I really like Geometrics. Actually, recent paper on, on, on uh, Mario, and of course, I love AlphaGo. But the AlphaGo machine was really designed to play Go, right? And Geometrics program was really designed to play Mario. And Leela, I'll show you actually at the very end of this, Leela playing Mario. And just to put the punchline on my slide, tell you that now, it's exactly the same copy of Leela that was maneuvering in the, in the blocks world. Okay, No extra software added to it um, for her. Um, so since she's not designed to solve a specific problem, her interface to the outside world or to the simulated world is how she, her state vectors are, are initially entirely created from what her senses tell her. OK, and uh, how does she build uh, more complex systems? I'll, I'll talk about that uh, later in the presentation. But the important parts of that is that she makes her own hypotheses and tries to assure that. Now, she does have some heuristics baked into her, um, uh, some of which have come from uh, um, Piaget. For example, you'll see a child in video, they'll often just repeat something immediately. When they, they pick something up, they drop it. They pick it up, and they drop it. Do that a few times so that they can get a bit of um, statistical power. And why not do that when, as soon as you do something interesting, why not repeat it immediately? Because you know you're in the situation. You might never be in that situation again. Um, and so a few, she uses some innate heuristics um, to help guide her learning. But ultimately, her learning of 
behavior of the world comes from uh, statistical knowledge and statistical power. Um, she will make plans, uh, hypothetical, make plans and test them out. And those plans, going back to composability, then become actions that are just as um, first class as the primitive actions that have come from the IO, I, IO system. Um, the, she makes plans either based on goals. They have some video where we actually tell her, hey, put your hand in the upper corner of your visual field or uh, get your hand into the middle of your fovea. And, uh, or, but if we haven't told her what to do, then she plays, she explores, right? She's like, oh, um, I've got these things that are maybe not, I'm not really statistically sure you know, whether they're really true or I can really depend on them or not. Can I find a way to get myself in a situation where I can test them out? Um, which is what we, I was gonna say we all see children doing, but we all did ourselves when we, when, when we were children. Okay. Um, since you can do all this, we get some other cool stuff. You know, if you can do explanations, her explanations are really boring. You'll hear them a little later. But over time, we think well, she'll actually be able to learn. So she has full power of her reasoning system to construct sentences as well. Um, she'll eventually learn what kind of explanations are germane and which ones to cause people to get bored. How old is she? Um, if you were to use Piaget's model, she's like a 14-year-old. 14 month old child. That's when you start start to get a bit of uh, object permanence and start to develop language. Um, of course, 14, real 14 month olds can you know, stand up and do a bunch of things that Leela can't. But by this standard, that's about where she is. So um, now to talk about why do I care? Why do I worry? Why, why do we even want to go into this into this problem? Okay. Well, here's a good one, right? I want to have to ride around in self-driving cars, and I don't know about you, but I prefer not to be killed by them. Um, and if I know that any self-driving car on the market, well, that people are actually putting on roads today, would happily drive across that bridge. And um, I myself would not drive across that bridge right now, given that there's a boat carrying part of the bridge away with it. <laughs> OK. Huh? It's a dead giveaway. Yeah, it's a dead giveaway to me, right? But uh, with these hand-built planners and uh, hand-built vision systems that people are using today, you know, nobody's thought about this scenario, and um, it pro you probably end up in the water. Okay. Um, here's another thing that we want to be able to solve, right? You, you want to have state that's not co you want to use covert state, right? State that's not in the image. And I think we've all seen. Uh, have you seen this vicarious paper where they took um, the uh, Pac-Man, Pac-Man solver, and they just translate it one pixel across. It's completely unable to solve the Pac-Man game, right? Because Pac-Man solver is doing all its state on a string of, of uh, bits with no semantics about them, and you know can't play Montezuma's Revenge because it's got hidden state. Well, these are problems that you know, you know, I look at this picture and I can you know immediately flash on the fact that there's this guy lying down, um, but then I realize that the the riders look pretty frightened too, right? And uh, you know, and it's like these kinds of problems we do them all every day, right? And yet, what set of neural networks can you build to solve that problem if that's your only tool? Okay. Here's another really important problem. Okay, because I was just looking after my parents for the past couple of weeks. You know, if I see them pick up a newspaper, I know they still read newspapers on paper. Um, and when they pick one up, I know immediately to say, oh, you know, they don't have their glasses on, and just tell them, right? And that involves a tremendous amount of, of, of hidden state. I got to have a model of who the other person is, how they function, how that relates to how I function. I have to have built all that state, that state that we just don't believe is, can be entered by hand um, or written. By, you know, or algorithms that can be all written by hand. It has to, be, it has to involve continuous incremental learning that's based on, on the environment in which it's working. And then, of course, you want to know why, right? And uh, basically, uh, debugging. Everyone talks about, uh, I want explanation. Why? Well, what they really mean is they want debugging. And, and actually, it turns out that uh, debugging and planning and learning are actually all the same task. You need the system to be scrutable, internally scrutable, so it can say, oh, I made, I myself made this plan, and I want to understand why it failed. 
Okay, I want to be able to make a plan to be able to tell ahead of time why it's failed. And if I can do that, I can actually tell you. Now, another thing is that when you've got millions of nodes in your, in your graph structure, you're not going to debug them with DDT, right? So you're going to have to actually ask the system to use its own tools to tell you what's going on. Um, we don't know how, how far this scales because humans are actually notoriously terrible at actually explaining what they do. They just confabulate an, an, uh, an explanation ex post facto. Uh, but we're not as big as a human yet, so uh, right now Leela's actually able to, to, to create some explanations and we'll, we'll give them, we'll, we'll, I'll show you. Um, but the reason why it's important to say that these elements are, are tightly integrated is that's what gives the system resilience when things change. Um, and allows it to actually make cal calculus as to the validity of the plans it's, it's made before it does, or what to do when they fail. So that's why do we even care about these cases, right? Um, well, automation, you know, every time people come up with automation, they decide they've got machines that can think, right? My favorite machine actually is the governor, right? It's a very simple device. It does exactly what a human can do you know, measure the spring tension on a spring, yet it does what a human cannot do, which is do it continuously at, you know, 2,000 RPM. Um, but typically, you know, we've, we, 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 apart from, you know, actual machines like a, a windmill that grinds grain or a house, you know, building or something, uh, machines actually make decisions, make very, very trivial decisions, right? The industrial age was built on machines whose programs were given to them, their goals were given to them, and the operator was there to do all that other stuff that couldn't be simplified. And, you know, 200 years come by, and we've got neural networks that are, you know, basically a wonderful filters and discriminators. Um, but fine, when all the state is, co is overt, and you can look at the x-ray, you can tell a lot about what's going on. Um, but they're very fragile, as we know. And what we really want to solve is, you know, we don't want the same thing that just solves a picture of somebody's spine in a radio, in, you know, in an x-ray picture, to be driving our cars. Well, they're not adequate, right? They're still full of handwritten code, and you cannot trust handwritten code, right? All these cases of either very small variations of data or the outdoors, the real world, with very huge amounts of data are where all these systems fail because they have no, they have no model of common sense. It's easy to say they don't have common sense, but they have no model of common sense because they've only got a model of what's in the handwritten, handwritten network and which data were provided them. And you know where that goes? Uh, I think we've all seen this uh, great paper on, uh, on uh, attacks on, on, uh, on image recognition. Has everybody seen? Oh, uh, these, some of these are pretty good, like uh, uh, that one. I don't know. I can't see it, but a couple up. We've got a screwdriver, the soccer ball it's in the second slow. You know, you can kind of see why it kind of looks like a soccer ball, but the system has no concept of what a soccer ball really is. It only has its own data set, and therefore it either overfits or underfits because that's all it knows. So you've got to use a human at the end of the day to decide whether it's really found a soccer ball or not. Um, Siri notoriously has the same problem. It has no sense of state. And so humans are continually puzzled by Siri, right? I like this one. Siri, I'm bleeding really bad. Can you call me an ambulance? OK, from now on, I'll call you an ambulance. <laughs> you know, it's funny, right? Because of course it's funny, because we know it's stupid. Siri has no idea of what you're really trying to accomplish when you say, call me an ambulance. So she just overfits and does something. And you know, when people actually care, then they just don't let people get close to them. Right? SRI have to do that. Hmm? SRI have to lock the room. Exactly, you know? And uh, because it had no idea um, what was going on. And actually, on my previous slide, there's a picture of an elevator, an automatic elevator, because that's the robot that most people use. Right? Outside that, most people don't even come in contact with a robot. Why? Because it's just too dangerous. So I had this discussion with Marvin before he died. And Lila and I presume there's going to be a flat earther. Uh, what do you mean by a flat earther? She'll say, she'll think the world is flat. You could sail off the end, then you go off wherever those ships go off to, as an example. What if, because, what if you put Lila in a rocket? Well, you know. You could you could give Leela all the arguments that the flat earthers get, and Leela could potentially could potentially deny because if she had no other outside outside knowledge to bring to bear, in fact, and in fact, you know, humans. That's right. Humans also overfit very gradually. But you know what's really good, and this goes back to self-driving car, is that 
we don't overfit in the car case very often. In fact, we have a whole bunch of strategies to use, right? I don't actually spend any time worrying about what that thing is that flew into the road. I just slow down. Do I have the time to adjust it? I overfit on things that don't matter, you know, global warming, nuclear war, um, stuff that really isn't going to matter to me, flat earth or, vac or anti-vaxxers. But on the stuff that people really care about, I, don't over I almost never overfit on putting a glass down on a table or, um, you know, what whether to be rude to someone. I don't know. We're so far away from that, I don't know yet. <laughs> Give her a few years. Some will be. Right. So when I go back to saying Leela is not a program or an algorithm, it's because you know, Leela uses a, brings a whole bunch of tools to bear. Um, I'd love to say the Society of Mind, but we're a long way from, we're a long way from that, speaking of Marvin. But you know, I, I mean, I've been through several waves of this. Remember at the expert systems? That seemed like a really great idea. Right, I'm just in KSL just down the road here, actually, worrying about expert systems. And it's just, you know, not only are they brittle, but the cost of putting them together was too high. Oh, well, then there's, you know, psych. I wasted, I don't know how many years of my life I spent on, on psych. Um, uh, I might have even generated that, that picture. Um, and, uh, you know, huge amounts of human, human uh, time put into it, but without any actual semantic binding to anything. It's just a exercise in abstraction. And the neural networks, you know, deep learning, they're pretty great. But guess what? What are the big careers in AI these days? Cleaning data, right? That's where the big hiring is, in cleaning data. And then they're just handwritten programs. I mean, they're, OK, that's a little unfair. But I mean, they're not, the, the, the internal structure of them is not self-organized. You write the program by how you connect the layers. So they're still a handwritten program. And the question is, how can you get the programs to work for themselves? Well, you need traditional computer science. Okay, this picture. I was driving. I was actually in a hurry because I was driving to a to a hospital. I didn't take the picture on that when I was on my first trip by, um, but I knew to slow down and prepare for a sharp left turn. And I showed this picture to somebody who will go nameless, who was running a major self-driving car company. And the answer to this, you know, like the week after I was in this picture, he's like, first of all, we will have seen everything. And, uh, and in fact, it's true, right? San Francisco's mapped three every three days, San Francisco is remapped. And yet, all, what happens between those three days? That's when all the interesting stuff happens, right? Um, you can't plan for everything, right? Uh, the Uber guys ran over a woman walking a bicycle because they even saw her. Their vision system and neural net saw her, but their handwritten planner, no one had thought to say, don't run over women walking bicycles. Right? Don't drive over bridges of which boats have not have taken away a piece. I mean, I personally have never seen this in the flesh, and I still would not drive over this, right? Um, and then the, the thing is, you can't compute everything, right? I mean, you cannot compute the power set of all the ways to put these engine parts back together. It becomes computationally intractable. And yet humans by using abstraction and having an internal model of how pieces should go together, do a pretty good job. Humans have some hardware assists that we're not sure we won't put in the computer. You've got bin packing hardware in your brain, things like that. But you're not going to do it with a flat, semantic-free model where you try out every, every case. That is not scalable. So Leela does it differently. Okay? As I said before, it comes from objects and actions. What are the state changes I expect to see if I take this action, because you know, can I put the world in the state I want it to be? Well, I can't do that unless I put it in this other state. So I can make a plan, make a plan to do that. There is no single chair option. If I'm walking around and I have a Leela robot with me and I'm feeling weak, I want to sit down in a chair. But what if I'm out in the woods? There's no chair. None of us would think twice about sitting on that stump. Or this room is full, I've got a hamburger or something with me, I want to put it on a table. I'm not even going to think twice. I'm just going to turn this chair down and put down this thing that I think all of us would use the chair for, a table. In fact, if we're talking, I probably wouldn't think about it. It says, I'll put your pen down on the table, we'll blah, blah, blah. And you would know exactly what I'm talking about. Why? That's because I don't have a single object that represents, oh, this is a chair, this is a table, this is what a sitable object, which is what we were doing in the psych days. Okay. What we call, what we think of as objects, uh, in the world or, or semantic uh, concepts in the world are really emergent phenomena. In Leela's world, they're actually emergent phenomena that come out of a little cluster of little schemas, 
about how I would want to talk about that. Because it's really true. I mean, this is the old platonic problem, right? How do you define a chair precisely? The answer is that's an incomplete question. How do I define a chair precisely as I can for a given purpose? So what does Leela do to do that? I mean, of course, her vision system is going to start out by grabbing a, a, a chunk of pixels. But it's not going to take those pixels and it's saying, can, I group, can these pixels cause states that I can then use? Uh, do these pixel relationships represent states which I can then use as fodder for making a plan to accomplish the goal I want to I wanna, I wanna make? So that means you know, some of them are functionally learned behavior about it's got to be big and strong enough to, to support me. Uh, it's got to be an angle. It's got to be wide enough you know, from my bottom. Um, and then, you know, both of those things are true of the tree stump as well as, a, as, well as, in, the, um, uh, as, well as in the chair case. You know, we don't have any kind of frame system yet, but I imagine our search is going to be affected by, constrained by that as well. And again, that's a kind of an underfit that humans often, often exhibit. So Leela has color and stereo vision. Uh, Leela does not have stereo vision. Leela has very simple color vision. But, Remember, Leela, the agent, just talks to the world through a pipe and has no, uh, initially assigns no semantics to the, um, to the state, primitive state um, items, that uh, state variables that come over its connection to the outside world. So in theory, you could plug its optic nerve into its hearing nerve, et cetera, and like the guy did with the ferrets. And it would, Leela would eventually learn how that world worked. Uh, she really has no, no concept of that. So is Flat surface and tight off the ground, something that it discerns, or is it something that is right now? Synthetic? Right now, in our in our model, the system has um, uh, absolute proprioception in the system, in, it, in, it, in its world. So um, it would get height off its ground by moving by, uh, and does not have does not doesn't have perspective in the vision system at the moment. It would get height off the ground by basically knowing where its hand was if it were touching it. But going back to what I was saying, it, you know, Leela, since Leela composes a set of primitive items, if we were to develop a stereo camera and have it look at the world, after a while it would start to build correlations of knowing that I can't put something, I can't let go of something unless I believe my hand is in the same height as the thing that I'm letting go. So since you brought up soccer balls, an exercise ball is an example of something that is not a flat surface, but many people sit on it or consider it yes. suitable to sit on. And how would Leela treat that? Uh, I mean, I, I believe is that Leela will, over time, learn that certain things with certain properties obey, proper, obey uh, behavior, exhibit behavior that is consistent um, through standard statistical means. I mean, we'll use a neural network to, we'd use neural networks, of course, to divide and conquer in these large um, state spaces. Um, but Leela is not going to grow up with any, not going to be introduced with any inherent knowledge uh, about that, uh, you know, about how balls behave or whatever. And I must say, the first time I saw someone sitting on a ball at a desk, I was quite surprised. Um, and I, no, but it's great. I'm going to spend some time thinking about it, right? And uh, that's one of the things we're actively working on, on building those models where Leela can think on her own. You know, so basically, Leela doesn't have to jump off the cliff to know that jumping off the cliff is a bad idea. And a lot of that's like, oh. But even now, when she looks at something, it's like, well, what kind of experiment would I need to do to decide whether this thing is true or false. Right? Like if I saw you sitting on a, on, a, on a ball and you got up, I'd probably personally go and try the experiment, fall over or not, whatever. Again, Leela's a 14-month-old child without a lot of moving things. But all of the, all the mechanisms that are involved in doing that are in her. I don't know if that sounds like a hand-wavy answer, but that's, that's where we are at the moment. OK. So Again, it's not a monolithic system with a single, you know, okay, this is our view of the world. Everything's built out of this view of the world. Um, this kind of goes back to what we're saying about how, um, uh, you know, the, you, you use different pieces where they were, where we're, we're kind of guided by human beings. You know, human beings' brains have brainstem functions that are highly compiled and themselves generate more sophisticated state information. Um, either in the, you know, like literally in proprioception in the brain stem or in recognition in the visual system. And so we're using ne neural networks to, uh, uh, to divide and conquer, like I said, to divide and conquer in some of the large parts of the state space. Um, this is a slide for somebody else. But this shows that, you know, again, 
you don't necessarily have to have a lot of, you know, you, you don't have a primitive item of what a piece of wood looks like, but emergently you can build a, a synthetic state of, oh, that's what, um, that's what a piece of wood looks like. And whenever you see that, that function runs, and now I've got that, that, that state variable becomes tr true. And then it can use plans that are based on that. So how does it build these more complex plans? Um, we use Piaget's model um, precisely of what children do uh, in early, you know, in infant, in infant development, right? So initially, Leela wakes up. She has no schemas, is what, what uh, Piaget called them, uh, of how to relate items to uh, items, you know, state items to, and uh, to state transitions. So she just begins blindly executing, and it's actually quite boring in the first few thousand experiments she does, which are mostly just moving one, her hand in one direction or moving her eye in one direction. Um, but after a while, she has a mechanism um, that, that runs over the state transitions each time an action is taken to start to look for correlations, which she then has an inherent heuristic that says try to reinforce promising sets of, of correlations. Don't, don't just hypothesize them and add them to my library. But if I have some that I hypothesize, do a few experiments to decide whether they're really valid or not. And that process is, uh, was called by Piaget accommodation. And the nice thing is that as you start, to, as, as she's, the code does, she does, starts to build more reliable schemas, then she tries to use these reliable schemas in plans to increase the value of those schemas, and now starts to learn of how those fit in, how those lead to new subsequent correlations, only focusing on the ones that she's already found to be valuable. Right? You're not trying to do an n squared search of every state combination in the world at every step. What you're trying to do is to say, I've been successful in this area. Let me try to build on the successes that I've already, that I've already had. And then eventually, once you've built a set of that, uh, of, of of believable schemas and reliable plans, she can then branch out and say, well, let me explore some parts of the space where I have not had so much success before to either drop them, dro drop these hypotheses, or uh, reinforce them and make them more powerful. So to do that, therefore, to go back, you know, one of the processes we do this is not just new actions, but actually to develop these new states. I think you, were, Mark, you were asking me about the synthetic states, right? So. She, since she's building this, I'll show you some video of this. She builds new state vec new states that she didn't have before, which was, oh, I see. I see an object that I've learned otherwise I can't move my hand through at a particular location. Whenever I see that, I can't move my hand through that location. Um, and she builds, she, then, then she can incorporate that kind of state into her, um, into her model. And the interesting thing is, so this is a little, uh, complex uh, picture. If you're looking at a blocks, this is in a blocks world. So on the left, you see there's uh, two blocks. In that, yellow, in that yellow box is her vision system. So we've got one that's outside her vision, one that's in. And in the light green, that's actually the foveated region, so what she sees. Now, she doesn't know when she starts up what's her hand, what's a yellow block, what's anything like that. Um, we, she has to learn that all through, through exploration. and. Uh, but she starts to learn, oh, if I see something there, I cannot move my hand through it. She doesn't know what it is. She doesn't know that that location is somehow excluded. What she ultimately, first she does, of course, but ultimately she learns, oh, when I see, if I learn that I'm excluded there, oh, and that's correlated with seeing something there. Then later when she can move her hand through and there's nothing there, it doesn't invalidate all her knowledge about moving. It says, oh, maybe I should be thinking that if I see something, I can't move it. Shall I do an experiment to verify that? So as you build this state, here's an experiment we actually did using OpenAI, a very simple test of just navigating in a blocks world. Um, and we built the playpen up from you know, 30 by 30 up to 200 by 200, which is what the open, open AI, uh, using the OpenAI code. And we actually used the winning OpenAI uh, solver for this that was on their, on their leaderboard, free leaderboard. And not surprisingly, because it has to explore the entire world, I mean, this is what you, as a, as a human computer programmer, you'd be shocked if you didn't see this, right? Uh, because you don't want to write a program that explores the entire board in every possible position and then needs to do that in order to learn how to solve the problem of how do I get from here to there. Uh, Leela, because she can do composition just like a human can, 
has a much more linear behavior in how long it takes her to learn how to solve, how, how, to, how to come up with the solutions to being given, asked that question at any time. Um, so uh, I think I'll skip over this slide. Maybe we'll come back to that later. Because another thing that's important is I talked about language. Okay. And um, one of our team members is a computational linguist. Sorry, our team has a very high MIT bias. I um, hope that doesn't offend anyone. Um, and <laughs> Eugene. Um, so the question is, how do you acquire, how do you add language to Leela? And again, going back to how humans are guided and how, because of Piaget, how humans do it. I, anybody who here is a parent probably remembers that when your child is small, you're just continually narrating life to your child, right? Here we're taking the bowl out. No, we put it on the counter. I mean, just like continually just narrating nonstop of what's going on. So we built a teacher that narrates, at the moment, unbelievably dumb sentences, subject, verb, object, um, sentences to Leela, um, which she primary, where she uses almost exactly the same mechanisms um, that she does for all other learning to start to correlate language with activity. Now, correlating language activity is a little bit more complicated than, long, than uh, correlating your own vol volition with, 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 with activity. Um, because people use language in a much less structured way. And so sometimes there's ambiguity. You'll say corner because it's in the corner, but you might, you know, you move, Leela moves her hand right, and we might say it's in the corner. Or we might say you moved it right. Or we might say, you know, so, you know or we might, we might say before you, you might point something in the field. There's a, there's a red ball over there. Um, and, uh, and so Leela has to, so we have some additional mechanism to allow Leela to have a more uh, broad view of what linguistic utterances are. But apart from that, all of her learning and the correlative mechanisms that she uses are exactly the same that she uses to operate in the physical world. And she uses those resulting graph structures that she generated to actually generate the sentences um, that she makes on this mark. Did she learn negation? Or? Uh, at the moment, she has not learned negation. Um, so you can't say, no, that's not right? Or? No. At the moment, we cannot say that. Um, Doesn't that hinder learning? It's, it's, it's complicated enough good right now, but yes, that's right. Um, and I don't know what At least stuff. it slows it down. Well, you know, it's, I'm glossing over something. Part of the reason we don't have that is there's a representational The question of, the, of whether we should, uh, whether Leela needs negative state objects at all to operate or not is also, it's a, it's a point of argument with us. And we haven't run very good experiments yet to decide if Leela, you know, Leela could be faster and more just as effective or not uh, with that. Um, but you know, I have to go modify the code to allow that. And I, I, I'm not sure if Cyrus is waiting to work on that problem until we've resolved some of that. I just. I'm not working on the linguistic part of the of the but system. But you did have an example before of the drone avoiding the place where a previous drone crashed. That's yeah, but that's not an, in that case. It's not a not. This is the case where I said, oh my my plan will not succeed. This is no, that's no different from the positive case. This is hence our argument, where um, you know if I've got something here and I want to move my hand from it, well, I've eventually learned I can't move my hand through objects that I can see. So therefore, I will make a plan that does not involve that. Uh, and you know, partially, it's a philosophical question. You, know, you can have a detour is not enough. Huh? Yes. A detour is not enough if you need Right. Yeah, it's just it, a better. It's just a better. And so, do we, and, and, and so is our concept of negation just a, an artificial concept that we've layered on top of our view of the world? I mean, is the whole world considered nothing but piano arithmetic? I, I don't know. Uh, you know, that's, that, that, that's why this is a, still a research project. And at the moment, we have negative items. But I, don't, I don't believe that Cyrus has implemented any negative linguistic functions yet. So you call, you talk about the plan. Is, can we talk about one kind of plan as a hypothesis? And then can we say 
that there's a negative result from the hypothesis, that the hypothesis turns out not to be true? Or is this, am I trying to lay too much into it? I think you're trying to read too much into it because what happens is uh, a plan can succeed or fail. I mean, the plan can be very small, right? Like, I'm, I'm going to move my, I'm, my hand's on the table. I want to move my hand down. OK, I cannot do that. And Leela will eventually learn that it, that's not true if it's not touching something. It can move its hand down. But when it's touching something on the bottom of its hand, it could not move down. Um, and just standard statistics say, well, that, this operation does not get any more reliable when, the, when it's in this state. Oh, a, a, a different unrelated operation, which is, has a different set of predecessors, is successful. Well, that one will get be more of a more likely to be a candidate for executing a plan. So we would definitely say when we saw that, oh, she learned not to do this because that doesn't work. What she really learned was not to do it because it's not a candidate path to take. Now, so there's a philosophical question that. I don't know, um, and right now we plan to we, we plan to resolve it like we do with a lot of arguments. Well, let's just write some code and find out what seems to work. It could be that. I mean, there's a whole bunch. I mean, it's like a deep <laughs> philosophical thing. Um, uh, I was wondering because of that last slide, uh, which one? Parlez-vous français, Lila? Uh, oh, ce moment, et pas seulement anglais. At the moment, she only speaks English. Um, I know I'm really actually, um, since I'm the only non-Japanese speaker on the team, I'm really eager for Leela to also be learning Japanese in parallel. But it's sort of like the I.O. problem. We have enough bugs to fix right now. We'll just stick to one very simple language, especially since she really has no, she barely has English grammar at all at the moment. So you're asking me uh, where Leela is. Um, so Leela is uh, still up in the birth to two years phase. Um, in terms of cognitive development, obviously she can't walk, she can't do a lot of things that little, little babies also do. Um, but she, you know, she exhibits curiosity. I mean, that's coded into her, right? You've got nothing else to do. Go learn some reliability. But um, she has started to uh, learn um, you know, obje uh, um, object persistence. Uh, so she's basically in this, in this position of about a 14-month-old. Child, it's actually pretty, uh, pretty exciting. Um, she, got, she got there in less than 14 months, or longer than 14 months. Depends on how you mention. We've definitely been working on it longer than 14 months. Well, it's 14 plus nine, but no, we've been working much longer, longer than that. And also, a child does it basically with one brain. How many of us have been working on the, on, on the code, right? Um, but still, that gives you some kind of idea of where we are. I mean, in, in both in two sense. In one sense, there's a long way to go before you trust. Leela to act like an agent from a science fiction book. But actually, that's pretty good. Because remember, Leela doesn't have any explicit rules for things like coordinating vision and touch, okay, uh, for uh, you know, st uh, moving into by, by uh, understanding that you can actually exert force on, on objects. She developed all of those schemas on her own through experimentation, some experimentation which we gave her. You know, please move the blue block into your fovea, which, by the way, has two solutions. Typically, you can either grab the blue block and move it, or you can move your eye. And she'll do one or the other, depending on, on, on the situation. Um, but uh, again, we gave her sometimes instructions. Sometimes she just explored on her own. But that's how she builds her corpus. So let's look at some of these gold ribbon things. How do I? Start this. So, so here's Leela moving around in a blocks world. Think of her as having an eye with a foveated region in the middle. That you'll see as I move it. There's a little bounding box that shows you where where her vision. So there's stuff that she can't see. There's stuff that she can just see. Coarsely, I know there's something there, and then in the foveated region, she can tell, oh, it's got a color, and a, and and she can feel proprioceptively that it's got a texture. Eventually, she learns to correlate correlate those, um, and then 
she's looking down on the world. Now, um, so that's, here she is just, just exploring. Um, now, she, actually, uh, one of my uh, colleagues found a nanny cam on the web. Uh, sorry, a mother had posted her nanny cam video on the web. And uh, it was actually interesting to see that this little kid, sort of like Leela, <laughs> moves around, you know, and uh, if you actually look at it, she's like, picks something up, drops it four or five times, then rolls over and does something else, rolls this thing back and forth, continually does the experiments using this heuristic that we talked about. Oh, I'm in this situation. Let me repeat the action and see if it, if it gives me the same results. And you know, basically building schemas, just as Piaget said, basically in the same mechanism that, uh, that Leela is using. Um, now here's our schematic view from the physics world of what Leela's hand's doing. It's moving around. Sometimes it's in the fovea. Sometimes it's not. It's a pretty good heuristic to try to keep your hand in the fovea or whatever you're working on in the fovea, which turns out that's a heuristic that humans also exhibit. Um, Has she learned to move any of the objects? Yes, she does eventually learn to move the objects. If you switch on grappling in the, in the physics world, she builds a whole bunch of schemas around whether her hand is open or closed, whether, you know, when I touch something, if, you know, if, I, if I'm touching something and I close my hand, it's actually more of a magic magnetic thing, but still, you know, and then I move my hand, the thing moves. Or pushing an object from the side? At the moment, the only, the physics world that we have that has grasping in it, just, you can't move it unless you can grasp it. I mean, it's like one thing or another. Okay. Uh, she discovered stacking? No. Uh, right now, two-dimensional worlds on the computers we've got are pretty computer. Can you show this to Terry Winograd? Yes. <laughs> Just say it. You know, actually, I show, we showed someone uh, Shirdlu the other day, and they were amazed. They're like, you've learned how to do this? I'm like, no, no, no. This was done around the time we were born. <laughs> <laughs> On a PDB-10. Yeah, but he had evidence of the Yes. Wow. I, I've got more than that on my phone these days. So... Uh, we push a goal. Uh, I think, what do we say? Touch the pointy object. So she made a little plan. Block touch, moving pointy hand right, left. So she moved her hand down, touched it, and my hand's on the left. Uh, now the verbal command, that is we program the words into that, go to the top right corner. And we didn't really, they all, what does she know of top right corner? She knows top right corner only through the emergent behavior of correlating those words with the times that she found, she saw objects or her hand up in that top right corner. This is, yeah, this is actually issue. Block hand, right, moving, touch, pointy top. So the linguistics mod, the, the, the teacher will talk while the system's running. The teacher know, can look and know what the plan is and say, you're moving your hand right, or something like that. In this case, we gave a command using words. So it looks like she was selecting. No, the, the, the person making the video clicked on that. Oh, okay. It could have just typed the words, but you know. It doesn't have a whole um, auditory system or anything like that. She just runs in the simulation at the moment. Probably not that exciting for a human 14 month old, but you know, she's just a computer. Of course, that was an ambiguous instruction. Top right corner of the space, top right corner of the object. At the moment, she's only. I was planning to do get to hand space. position one fall by moving my hand forward, but it was overridden. So this is because the I she needed tried to, to get hand position two fall. And was blocked, so she had to make a new plan in order to achieve the to achieve the goal. So she was able to explain that. Um, here I have a better explanation here um, using some of her synthesized natural language. So here she's just moving around randomly. She doesn't know anything at the moment, right? She just booted up. And every time I control C her, she dies. 
So in this case, she's dying. But now she started to build schemas. This is a little visualizer. This is a force-directed graph. But the interesting thing about the schemas that she builds is that you can see they form these semantic clusters. So every time you have a very simple one, you know, start out with an empty one right at the root, then those new very simple ones are force directed out. And then they seem to, f they, they, they tend to form clusters. And you can see the ones that are, has, she has found semantically very valuable in achieving goals, they cluster together. That would be this one up here. Down here, there's a much more barren piece of, of value. Either she hasn't explored it, or she, when she's explored it, it hasn't been very valuable. So she hasn't made very more plan, many more, uh, more complex schema based on, based on that. Um, but as she runs, you know, she, you can see her, her attention shifting to different sorts of things as she, as she moves. Every time she does, takes any action, it's an opportunity to learn. Oh, well, I mean, we have a serializer, so we can stop her and restart her when she stops. But every time you type control C, if you don't save, she starts out knowing nothing about the world. She has to start out building all her schemas over again. And there's a certain amount of randomness in it, so no two worlds are exactly the same. How long does it take her to get to the 14-month state? Um, to, to start her up and then have her run and explore the world and start to develop an idea of object persistence, um, like 100,000 steps. We could, huh? 100,000 steps. Oh, uh, on a machine like this MacBook Pro, that's a few hours. Now, a real human is doing a whole lot of other stuff, right? So we're just looking at a very specific set of, of things that are correlated with humans. But still, that's, that's pretty good. Go ahead. So I'm a little confused about the bootstrapping. Are there, does she start out with schema for building schema and for what an experiment is? No. Uh, Where do they come from? She, that is actually part of her, you know, Construction. Her, her, that's part of the, that's actually a piece of code that we wrote. A priori, like built There is a there is an inherent construction mechanism um, that it's a constructivist model, right? So there's a constructive mechanism that says every time you take some action, can you learn anything from that action? And she's hardwired she's hired to do that. What action she takes is completely dependent on, that's her choice, what predecessor state, what goal she was trying to accomplish. And what the state vector looks like is entirely a result of the physics system that she's plugged into. So if she's plugged into Mario Brothers, then her view of the physics world, what, what action she can take, what, state, what the state vector of the world looks like is entirely Mario's world. Um, if she's exploring the blocks world, then her view of what actions she has the ability to take and what the primitive state items are that come back every time she looks at the world uh, are entirely dependent by the blocks world simulator or ultimately the robot I want to hook up her up to or whatever. Right? So she, the, the, the algorithms in, within Leela, the, the, the stuff that, that, that we wrote, the lines of code that we wrote, ha make no presuppositions as to the semantics of any activity or the semantics of any state variable. She applies those semantics as she learns how they relate. And so when you are making decisions like that, like your code, you go back to PLJ. Yes. All right. I mean, there's other people. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, Gary Drescher was a student of Marvin's. I actually met him when I worked for Seymour. So you know, I think he was working for Seymour at that time. Uh, one of Ben Kuyper's students um, uh, also worked on uh, on some work related on, on on Piaget and the constructivist learning. I mean, constructivist learning was kind of popular in the '80s, like so many things got nuked by AI winter. Um, so, you know, we're looking at work. You know, we're, we we've been looking at other people's work and 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 reading Piaget to decide, okay, what kind of mechanisms do we want to emulate? But to the greatest degree possible, we don't want to have any preconception of what the world looks like. Now, if you start to look more about the human, obviously the human visual system generates a whole bunch of synthetic 
state variables, you know, because of its edge finders and line edge finders and all of that, all of that stuff. Um, probably we want to go that direction for the vision system because that is the thing that's most relatable to what humans do. But as far as the core reasoning system, it doesn't know anything and has no need to know about any of those things. Why do babies repeat actions? Isn't it to get mastery over the materials involved rather than because they think the outcome will be different for the identical action? Well, um, <laughs> maybe that. I, mean, I love that question because I, I, I mean, I'm just I'm trying to avoid being witty about it because I love that question so much. Um, I mean, first of all, why do babies do X? I have no idea, of course, why babies do X. But if I were to take uh, a, a Piagetian stance to the question of what babies do, um, from a computer scientist's point of view, I would say babies repeat action in order to build schemas that have statistic that are, that are, have statistical value for that in order to be able to accomplish to, uh, goals. So um, it's funny. I was just visiting my cousin, and uh, her grandchild was visiting, and he's also about fourteen months actually, and uh, a little bit older, eighteen months. And we were talking, and um, he was. We were sitting at the this coffee table, and he took a coaster, a rectangular coaster, and he stood, put it on the coffee table, which is about right height for him, and he walked around. I, mean, I love watching this because he got to the corner, he rotated ninety degrees, and he walked around. He did that about four times, and his mother said. Oh, he loves to clean. He loves to copy what we do, and he sees us cleaning. And I watched him, and he maintained the alignment of the edge of this coaster with the edge of the table all the way around. And after he'd done it about four or five times, he stopped right in front of me, rotated the coaster, which is square, 90 degrees, and then did the whole action over again, right? And I'm like, this kid is discovering abelian transformations, right? <laughs> As he does this, right? And you know, he is hard at work. And what he's done is he's like, first of all, he's like, okay, I verified that this thing is invariant. Plus, you know, he's helping learning to walk. He's doing a 50 different experiments or 5,000 different experiments at the same time. But then he does this other really great experiment. I'm going to change one variable. Is the rest of the behavior invariant? Wow, that's going to give me a ton of reinf reinforcement for a whole panoply of really interesting schemas. And then, like the little kid you saw rolling around, if you just did this once, like you're walking down the street and you rest your hand on a railing, and mommy says, take your hand off that dirty thing, right? Well, you might not ever encounter another railing in your life. Now, that may not be so bad because, OK, how much do you want to learn about a railing if you never saw one again? But why not repeat your experiment because you're already in the state where you can repeat it? Because then you might use that plan for something else and be able to build a more general and more powerful schema, which are actually more specific if you think about it, how, how it works. How often is it, if you are doing statistical cleaning, that the outcome of an identical action is different than it was before? Well, um, if I have a ball yes. on the edge of the table, and I push my hand over, and the ball rolls in some random direction, first of all, the next time I push my hand, no ball moves. So like a dog, it goes, gets the ball, puts it up. Next time I push it, it goes in a different direction. But at least I've learned that it falls off. And then maybe, you know, because I, I, I'm a kid and I've got enormous amount of patience to do this kind of thing. Eventually, I discover that how my hand is oriented relative to the ball. I mean, that to me is why babies do it. Now, you know, this is a, a guy who read Piaget who knows C++ and Lisp, right? So I could be completely confabulating that. But that seems to be to be the basic answer to your question. So your model is very good, and it's, 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 it's really wonderful. But there is a difference between an electrical system and the human nervous system. That's right. The electrical system had, is deterministic. The human nervous system is indeterministic. There's a lot of noise. And repetition. And stochastic control, so we no. Repetition has a function in the, in the, in the mechanics of the, how the nervous system works in a human being, which is different than in a human being. 
yeah. in an electric system. But, but Not that, that, that doesn't negate the value of what you're doing. It's just there is a difference. And exactly. I mean, you know, I got this 100 hertz machine with 80 giga neurons in it, right, and a 10 to the fifth fan out. That's a lot more nodes than I could ever fit in a computer that I can buy probably in my lifetime. On the other hand, the computers I, got, I buy in my lifetime have a you know, three gigahertz clock speed. That's, you know, you, you're right, we're using different algorithms. I'm pretty sure that the correlational mechanism that we use to do construction is not, uh, may not even be that close to what the hell is going on in this you know, piece of hamburger up there. Um, but it exhibits behavior which is similar. And the important, that's why I said it, we're, we're, we're guided by what humans do, but we don't try to emulate what humans do. And the important part of that is, you know, you, you can't tell the difference. If you can't tell the difference, it works, right? Is that I can, I can, if I toss something to Eugene, he'll probably catch it, right? And you also, if I touch something to Leela, I want her to order, catch it. I don't really care if Eugene's process to catch it and Leela's is, is, is to catch it. Um, or if I trip, and Leela, you know, Eugene's going to pull his leg out of the way. I want the I want the robot to do the same thing or catch me or whatever. But I I want the I want machines that ex, that exhibit what we would call common sense, which is they just do what we expect, right? Such a vague word. That was another one of Sykes' stumbling points, right? Common sense just means the stuff that I expect to know that no one really told me because I learned it iteratively and I've observed everyone else learned it. it or sorry, I learned it experimentally. And I learned a bunch of other people also learned, learned it experimentally. So if Leela experiments with something physiologically similar to what humans have, then probably she will exhibit behavior that I find comprehensible. That's kind of the whole thesis in a nutshell on that topic. So do you have a system for backtracking and debugging? I beg your pardon? Do you have a system for backtracking and debugging? Like, why did you think this, or how did you come up with this? Well, we can ask her, why did you think that plan, right? When she, when she moved her hand, I think I might have another video where she tries to move her hand. No, where she tries to make a, did I finish running this video? I didn't. Here's one. I, I think in this video, she actually um, fails to achieve her goal. All right. And, uh, and then does so. I don't know. That's just a pretty picture. Now she's been running about 20, 25,000 steps. Um, Oh, 10,000 steps. Okay, so here's, a, yeah, this is kind of interesting. This actually is exactly your question. Thank you for asking this question at this point in the video, Eugene. Um, so here's, that's a pretty uninteresting goal, right? I started my hand on the side, moved to the other side. There's nothing in the way. All right. I did it. Ra me. She's learned that that plan can be reliable when um, she doesn't see anything in that path. Or she hasn't learned that it is unreliable if there is something in the path. So now we move her back a bit, we move this thing out of the way, and then we go back to the, we go back up to the starting point, and now tell her, we've told her to move back to that same goal state. Oh, we can't do it. She goes around it, okay? Um, I think, oh, that video, that video cuts off. She doesn't give it, so we could ask her what happened. You might have heard her say it's blocked. She'd say, I tried, I don't know in that particular plan whether she tried to hit it, was blocked, made a brand new plan that involved not going through something that's blocked, or whether she'd seen it. Over time, she'll learn, oh, if I see something, I can't go through there. And you can just ask her, how does your plan work? Um, and at the moment, like I said, she actually tells you the plan. Um, so I'm actually supposed to run out of time, so I'll just go something else. Um, here is uh, Mario. Um, she's playing Mario, and what's interesting in this, this is, the, again, OpenAI uh, Mario uh, state vectors. Um, but, you know, she doesn't have to play 10,000 games. Oh, she just died. Um, she, I, think she, I think this is about 25 games. And she did something interesting here, which is that she learned, you know, she's kind of, okay, I can hop around. I'm exploring what I've learned. Uh, I can, you know, sometimes something interesting happens when I, move, when I jump up. And, uh, and here she goes. Or am I supposed to say he, because it's Mario Brothers? I don't know. Um, but anyway. Yeah. So this is interesting. So after 25 games, 
Mario has learned, oh, I can still use the heuristics that I used, I knew, to play in a level, even though this level looks very different from the level I saw before. Okay. Um, the geometric guys, Uber, um, just released, like I said, a paper on this problem. Um, but they did, of course, a lot better than this. On the same hand, they built, it a, they built a Mario playing game. This is exactly the same program that was moving in the blocks world. Uh, in this case, she hadn't, she hadn't loaded her blocks world knowledge. Um, but we could try that. And she'd eventually learn, oh, my state vectors behave differently. Um, we just haven't figured out yet how to really make that really exciting. Like, people don't do so great when they lose their hands either. I'm actually gonna show you one other random picture, which I think is really cool. So this is a different graph of her state space. In this case, it relates not the schemas, but the state items. And there's a lot of, uh, this is actually just it's probably, well, I'll just tell you. So there's a lot of dense information in the middle of, of here where she's learned a lot of schemas about how items relate, like objects and whatever. And again, this is a force-directed graph, right? What's really interesting is that sort of hooded structure on the top. If this were, I, I just clipped this out of a, a demo. But if you were to move the mouse over those nodes, you'd find all of those nodes are actually return, reflect proprioceptive locations of the hand and the eye, right? So just like our visual system has a 2D map in it, she developed the 2D map, which you know, was forced apart by the force graph. I think it's actually a coincidence, but we were just so excited when we saw that, because it, it seemed like a, a it seemed, yes, yeah, a mental map. It just seemed like a physiological analog. Probably actually isn't, but uh, it's so cool, right? It's like, oh, this is the back of my head with a medium visual system. All right, anyway, I'm pretty much out of time, so I'm going to um, end my talk there, unless there are a few more questions. I think I have a couple of minutes. Can you talk about what? Can you talk about what you, what you, the tools that you use, languages, pre-existing database structures, whatever that you use to implement this with? Yeah. Um, so we have a research implementation written in Java, um, and then we have another implementation uh, written in C plus uh, plus that's aimed to be higher. You know, significantly higher performance, scalable, um, multi-threaded, et cetera. Of course, it's much less mature than the Java implementation, so it's, it fails much faster <laughs> at the moment. But those, those tools then, uh, all those visualization systems just written in JavaScript <coughs> in Node. So all that force-directed graph stuff, you know, one of, my, uh, one of my partners, he just like, oh, like as fast as we like, oh, it'd be really interesting to see a picture of that. He's just pulls out a few node modules and there we got a visualizer. It's kind of astonishing to me. Um, then a bunch of the, the physics simulators that we use uh, are written in various languages, Python, whatever. All the stuff that ties out into TensorFlow is Python code that the system calls. Um, and uh, I think that's all the languages that we're, that we're using. No, just, a, just graph structure. I, I have a serializer that will serialize to, to a SQL database, but that's it. Why would you ever type control C? <laughs> Why wouldn't you just let this learn continuously until it makes a mistake and then back up <coughs> to the point and then where the mistake was made and fix the code and then continue learning? A lot of answers to that question. Um, one answer is it's a research project, and so you know you need to recompile the code and run again. So you need to control C, maybe save your state, pick it up from there. Yeah. Uh, when you talk about a mistake, what's a mistake? I mean, if Leela tries to do something and is unable to do it, that's not a mistake. She's just unable to do it. You know, I try to walk through the wall. I can't get through the wall. I learned something instead of saying that was a mistake. Mistake is, um, if you mean a, bu a bug in the code. Yeah, but in th and there's another thing, which is you know this Java program completely drowns the the part of the impetus to go to some different technologies. That just this big single threaded thing with the Java memory model, you know, fills up your computer in you know a few hours and then it slows to a crawl. Um, so, but ultimately, yeah, when there's I really think of there as being one Leela implementation, and she just learns 
Um, we thought about what fleet learning means for a system like this as opposed to you know, traditional neural network, right? How, how can two Leela instances running in a small machine that's run, how can they reconcile? I mean, that's what humans do, right? We talk. Basically, I'm just trying to cause experiments to happen in your head when I talk to you. This whole conversation or talk I'm giving here is a way to try to cause little experiments to happen in your head that create schemas that are somehow, I believe, parallel to what are in my head. So maybe that's the path. Um, but yeah, ultimately, you'd want Leela to just continue aggregating knowledge because the smarter she gets, the more interesting things she can do. And still, it doesn't give up the ability to do the simple things. Um, so maybe I should say the reason we control, control scene today is due to the limitations of technology and our implementation. And in theory, Leela could even talk to different kinds of physics systems. You know, already, if you were to cut off if you had Leela with two arms, you cut one off, she would over time learn that, okay, I can no longer, things that involve moving my left hand just stop being reliable. You know, or she, we could give her a brand new sense. She'd eventually learn to just integrate that new sense in, in what she knew. So if I give you the reason to follow the path, the, the first uh, computerized trading system uh, was developed in Japan. And it worked fine until there was a structural change in the stock market. And this was at a time when a million dollars was still worth a lot of money. And it was losing a million dollars a minute, and there was no way to turn it off. And so one of the traders took an ax and went around and started cutting cables until he could disable it. Um, and this video, this video of that was shown on Japanese uh, national television. So let's think about that story in a different way, though. Okay. Um, if you have a child, and your child is learning to drive and has crashed a few cars, you don't control C your child. You just, it's really frowned upon. What you do instead is you buffer the child from automobiles, right? So if you think of Leela being an agent, you do it just like you would with any other human being. You're like, don't touch that dial rather than control seeing the human. Right. You know, just think about how. There, there, there may be, you, 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 you may not be perfect in your construction. There may be. But that's true with humans as well. Like I was just starting in the beginning with Eugene, right? Humans overfit all the time. I mean, anti-vaxxers. So we have mental hospitals and jails, and we have ways of, of doing control C with humans too. Well. We also, unfortunately, have ways of control seeing humans. But, um, but yeah, and in a more just world, we don't actually control see them, but we do buffer them from the things that cause trouble. Anyway, all right. Well, yes. I have an enormously long to-do list of things to work on. Some of which were were brought up here. Um, we have someone who uh, said they might give us some money to actually pay us to actually work on this. So if anybody else wants to participate in that, that would be great. That would be just another to-do item. Um, but you know, there's a whole bunch of linguistic questions. There's a bunch of experiments on, um, I mean, there's, there's plumbing, right? How do we get the system to, to scale? There's a whole bunch of algorithmic things. I mean, some of these, some of these algorithms don't scale, and we're going to have to develop a frame system of some sort. Right? We've been talking about that. Um, uh, the system doesn't have very good uh, temporal prediction right now, right? I mean, it doesn't really know throw a ball and it's going to do all this curve and all that stuff. Um, uh, I have a theory of how to do that, and so that's going to be one of the things I, I will be working on. Um, there's, you know, I.O. I actually want to move a little robot around, have it navigate, and see how the system, you know, can deal with that. Right now, time works in lockstep with all of its physics worlds. Like, the, like most of the uh, open AI things, time is discrete, right? But actually, the real world time is not discrete. So you know, we got a whole bunch of work to do to figure out how to handle that kind of stuff. So there, I mean, there's like everything from ordinary programming to thinking about how to bring up some more complex capability. You know, grammar is very simple. And fortunately, none of my to-do items are on the computational linguistic side. I know very little about that. Um, but all of it is, you know, how do we bring Leela up to the point where she could actually work or alongside a human to make their life 
easier in a predictable way, right? Preferably not flying drones to control C people in other countries. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that answers your question. Uh, half a dozen people, four years, or 35 years, depending on how you look at it, mm -hmm. right? Some <laughs> experience. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, I don't know how many hours I've been talking to Marvin about stuff like this, right? Being paid to work on this stuff. Um, so you can look at it that either way. Uh, how many lines of code? I don't know. The whole system <coughs> is like 30,000 lines of code. So we probably wrote 300 or 400,000 lines of code to get there. Right. Well, that's a great price when you consider how many million lines of code Windows 10 is or mm -hmm. lots of other things. And can Windows 10 do this? <laughs> <laughs> Get a useful robot out of this? That's my hope. There's lots of things that people do that really their life would be much better if humans were doing it. I mean, if machines were doing it. Can yeah. we go back to the bridge and the boat with the piece of the bridge? Yeah. And how much learning would be required for Leela to understand that situation and not driving over the bridge? For example, not as much as you might think. I, I mean, I, my belief is that it's that's. That's probably not as hard as you think. I mean, because humans use a lot of interesting heuristics in those kinds of situations. Um, like, you remember the, the Tesla car that decapitated this guy? Uh, and, um, and of course, the explanation for Tesla is, well, it was white, and it was a sky. So you know, we're like Werner von Braun. We just couldn't care less. Um, and, yet, and that was probably true. You couldn't see it. But a human would have done a couple of things. A human would have seen the back of the truck and the tractor, and would have had some idea that typically there's something in between, right? And the second thing the human does is they slow down, right? You drive when you can run off some very high-level schemas that you already have got, right? I learned to drive in Boston, so, you know, basically you touch the car in front of you kind of things, right? Um, but as soon as you lose your comfort zone where those high-level schemas are applicable, you immediately slow down because you've got to start making more complicated plans from scratch or at least from more, you've got to come up, you've got to synthesize the plans because again, them being composable means, oh, I'm in a state where I can use this, I'll just use it right away. Oh, no, I've got to make a new one or it could depend on something that's less reliable, maybe I better be looking at each step along the way. People do that kind of thing all the time, right? And, you know, but well, you don't want to write all those cases down by hand. Yeah, but if you consider what is it about that scene that's unusual, it's not that there's a boat. No. It, it's not that the boat has this piece of metal attached to it. It's not that the piece of metal looks a little bit like the thing ahead of you. Well, you know, you typically don't see boats with weird-ass pieces of metal in the front of them, except in very unusual cases. And in fact, if you were going around in a... If, if, if you routinely drove over bridges in an industrial city where they had some of those boats that pushed other barges around and had big you know, rhubars on the front of them, then in fact, you might in fact fall into this problem. You would overfit. In that, a human would also overfit in such a case. Um, going back to my you know, meatloaf and, uh, and cat case, right? You sometimes will have trouble if you stumbled across a meatloaf while wandering around in your backyard because you just don't expect to find one unless you have a small child. And, um, and those are the kinds of, uh, I, I mean, it's, to me, it's OK. It's OK if the machine makes similar mistakes to humans. I, I really, of course, it shouldn't, right? It should never make a machine. That's why we want the machine, right? Let the humans make the mistakes. But realistically, you know, people are full of flaws. And we build structures around dealing with those flaws. And let's make machines that fit into those kinds of structures. And OK, you know, you find that happening, right? People get into situations, you're like, I would never do that. But they were in an environment that was familiar to them, and so they didn't recognize the peril they were in. Well, it's interesting you brought up the HAL analogy, for instance. I didn't. So, well, no, I mean, a bunch of people brought up the HAL analogy. But uh, I'm trying to remember what's his name, David, so and so who works at the Rico Center, who, who did this book about HAL. I'm more curious about how other portrayals 
of machines in the media, which are semantic in their nature, uh, actually affect how people think about robots. Because I worked for an agency for 30 years, which had a lot of skepticism to robots, and they really don't want to get AI that, roving that, around Mars. That, oh, that, oh, that agency sent all tons of robots out where people couldn't go repair them. Yeah, but they're not nearly as sophisticated as the things you're trying to do here. I mean, we have lots of internal discussions. And actually, I, I seem to recall um, there were two robots in Interstellar, TARS, and I can't remember the name of the other one. Uh, there were a lot of people who, who thought that those were actually pretty good portrayals of robots, and one of them self sacrificed himself for the, for the mission as well, too, at the end of the movie. You had to see the movie Interstellar as an example. But, uh, well, so a lot, a lot of people are afraid of robots, but I was saying that I was just looking after my parents for the past couple of weeks. And the interesting thing is that my mother would be happier with a robot to look after than a human. And, uh, and the reason is that she would feel uh, weak if a human had to do this thing. It's embarrassed. Yeah, it's embarrassing, right? It's like people who clean their house before the cleaning lady comes. A robot, yeah. yeah, and she would not feel that, she does not feel when she uses her phone as a prosthesis that that implies anything any moral failing in her, right? And so a robot that fried an egg for her or helped her up the steps or ran a bath or any of those things would not, in her case, feel any kind of uh, diminution in her sense of humanity, um, which is counter to what a lot of the uh, science fiction stories and the Golem stories think about robots. Okay? Cool. All right. Thanks. Thanks.